Now, it was ex explosive as adding potassium to water. Sexist, idiotic, pathetic. Just some of the responses to Sir Tim Hunt, the Nobel Prize winner, after he told a conference of women in South Korea that the trouble with girls in science was that they cry when you criticise them and they're a distraction in the lab because they fall in love with their male counterparts. Well, I suspect you don't need to be a scientist to know when you've kicked off a real storm. In just a moment, we'll discuss the impact of those comments on a science industry where women are still struggling to achieve parity with men. But first, let's hear a little of what Sir Tim Hunt told BBC Radio before he left that conference. He claimed his remarks were intended to be humorous. This was a lunch for women journalists and women, particularly women scientists and engineers, actually. And um, I was asked at short notice to say a few words afterwards. And I thought it was ironic that... Um, I came after three women who very nicely thanked the organisers for the, for the lunch. And uh, I said it was odd that they had asked a man to make any comments. And uh, I'm really sorry that I, I said what I said. It was a very stupid thing to do in the presence of all those journalists. And what was intended as a sort of light-hearted, ironic comment um, apparently was interpreted deadly seriously by my audience. But what I said uh, was quite accurately reported. It's terribly important that you um, can criticize people's ideas without criticizing them. And if they burst into tears, it means that you tend to hold back from you know, getting at the absolute truth. I mean, what science is about nothing except getting at the truth. Well, there it is. Let's discuss it. Uh, joining me here is Dr. Jennifer Rohn from the University College London and Sarah Dickinson from Equality Challenge Unit, which focuses on gender equality in the sciences. Welcome both to the programme. Just uh, a gut instinct reaction from both of you, first of all. I was bewildered and shocked when I heard it. It was not, it was out of character, I thought, and somebody so intelligent to say that thing not only in front of a bunch of journalists, but at a luncheon honouring female scientists. I, I could not understand why he said those things and why he kept speaking and kept speaking and digging deeper and deeper. I was bewildered. Yes, those who were there were saying that uh, there was silence in the auditorium and yet he kept going mm. and going and people were sort of taking notes and scratching their heads. Uh, Sarah, what was your, your first instinct on this? Uh, they're unhelpful comments, they really are. Um, having said that, what it has done is actually sort of put the underrepresentation of women back on the agenda, back in the news. And so looking at that and hopefully sort of focusing on the positive work that's being done out there can be a positive outcome. I touched on it in the introduction. I mean, there has been an avalanche of criticism at, at these comments directed at him, obviously. But uh, do you think because of that, then per perhaps quickly this can be discarded or does it have the potential to do real damage, do you think? Um, I think what we need to do is focus on what the institutions, what higher education are doing to address the underrepresentation of women in science. There's a lot of good stuff that's going on in the sector. Um, things like the Athena Swan Charter, which is something I oversee, that looks to address the underrepresentation of women and the number of. Uh, and when you say underrepresentation, just give me an idea of what you're talking about in terms of uh, the scale of the, the disparity. Uh, so, at undergraduate level, there is uh, over 55% of undergraduates are women, but at the professorial level, it's only 18%. And uh, this isn't. Uh, this has been something that's been at that sort of level for quite some time. I've been in this field now for over 10 years and very little has changed from that. Uh, Jennifer, I mean, we played a little clip uh, of some of the explanation. There was more detailed explanation he gave in terms of explaining why he said what he said. Let me just read out, actually, uh, what he said, because he talked about, when he was talking about emotional entanglements in, in the lab, he said, uh, falling in love is uh, disruptive to the science. Uh, it is essential that in the lab people act uh, and are at a level playing fields. I mean, uh, 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 where is he wrong in, the, in that? Where he's wrong is the idea that it's, it's the responsibility of women to keep some sort of um, disru non-disruptive environment. So if you say that, that emotional women are disrupting a lab, what about the emotional men? I've seen plenty of men, I can tell you in my time, sobbing over their test tubes because things aren't going well. It's a very high pressure situation. Women cry, men cry. Women fall in love, men fall in love. Like in any office relationship, a lab is no different from any other workplace. And, and how can you stop that? And why would you want You're to? right, but then if you look at other sectors, look at, look at education and schooling and single-sex schooling, because hasn't that, isn't that acknowledging 
similar territory, which is that the opposite sex can, in the end, sometimes be a distraction. I think there have been a lot of studies show, shown, you can back me up on this, that, <laughs> yes. that teams of, comprised of men and women in science do much better. Uh, that women and men bring different things to the table, mm -hmm. and it's a more stable team. You can't avoid the opposite sex in science. You're collaborating all the time with the person across the lab, across the corridor, in another country. There are men and women everywhere in science, and to, to, to say that you can segregate them is ludicrous. And, Diverse teams equate to good science and there's research to back that up and in fact there's some really quite influential uh, scientific men out there who say that as well. And we heard a, a touch of, uh, of his justification about the comments about women, women crying if you criticise their ideas and the necessity to, to really test the science because that was the, the critical thing. Where in that argument does he go astray do you think? I, I think uh, part of it is sort of focusing on the women and the women crying and this need to sort of fix the women rather than sort of looking at maybe the sort of how the criticism is, is being done. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to... Uh, I, I, I think that... It almost stops yeah. you in your tracks, doesn't it? That, that's interesting that you, you pause like that to, to try to almost know how to come back. It is a very... The thing is, I've been in labs all over the world for about 20 years and I've never noticed a prevalence of women coming out of professors' offices sobbing. I, I, I don't see it very often. You hear stories, you know, I, I've cried in the lab before. I go to the loo, maybe I wash, put some water on my face, and then I get, get on with it. It doesn't affect my ability to do Do you think it'll put work. women off, <laughs> the temptation to go into to, to, to sciences? That's, that's the worry, comments like this from someone. I think from someone. can be so. off-putting, indeed. I mean, I, you will encounter sexism in any profession, and in, in science in particular, it, it is still there. I mean, there have been improvements, but there's still, we have unconscious bias, we've got overt bias, we've got a lot of obstacles. And if you have the impression that this really, really respected top level Nobel laureate is getting up and saying, you know, women are disruptive and they cry and they're sexual, and, and it, it's not helpful. Uh, how can that be helpful no, to encouraging yeah. people to go into it, science? It is interesting because you talk about mm. the progress. Both of you have talked about progress. Yeah. I mean, we were in India not that long ago looking at uh, just their space project, their enormously successful Mars probe. That was, in many parts, driven by uh, young female mm. scientists. So they're making great strides in, in some areas. How do you make more strides in this profession? You talked about the stats, which, which still are unhelpful. Yes. How do you make more progress in this area? Uh, we make more progress, um, I mean, uh, from my organisation, the Quality Challenge Unit, engaging with programmes like Athena Swan um, that gets institutions and departments to evaluate their own policies and procedures and look to sort of change them to make them more inclusive so that everyone can enjoy science. I think we need to do that because I think we're losing a massive skill set here. To lose, um, I mean, in some subjects, chemistry, for example, they start with nearly 50% female undergraduates and go down to 7% female professors. You're losing nearly 50% of the cohort there. That's 50% of, of talent, and we just can't afford to lose that if we're going to remain competitive in the global market. Well, as you said, right at the start, it, it set off a discussion, so that might be helpful. Sarah Dickinson, Jennifer Rohn, thanks for joining us here on the programme. Thank, Thank you. you.